Hello, everybody. My name is Linda Detweiler. I was a chemistry and physics teacher for 10 years, and today we're going to start talking about equity inside of the science classroom. To give you a little bit of background, I also taught our collaborative courses at my last school, and I've worked pretty extensively with the exceptional student education programs at all the schools that I've worked at. And that gives us the perspective of special education, but equity isn't just special education. Ta teaching in a low income school means that you're going to face different equity issues than if you taught in a higher income school or if you teach in a rural area, you're going to face different issues than if you teach in a suburban area or an urban area. So my goal today is to talk about equity, not just from the lens of these are our mandates from an individual education plan or from a 504 medical plan but rather what are issues that we may come across inside of our classrooms and then what can we do to address these and make science accessible to all of our students not just the students that already had a strong start and like always i do not read from a powerpoint presentation today's pre presentation has a lot more writing and a lot less pictures so i apologize in advance but I wanted to make sure that you have resources to get all of this additional information. Everything is linked to the slide deck. You will get a copy of the slide deck with the recording. We're about two days out on each one of the recordings, or if you're viewing this on YouTube, the slide deck is in the description below. So today's agenda, we're gonna talk about the difference between equity and equality. I feel like in the past five years we've really started to make this clear that the goal is equity when is equality when you have nothing and then equity once you have equality and i love that we have this differentiation between the two ideally we're moving towards equity but a lot of times people don't know what that even means so we're going to talk about that we're going to talk about the goals that i personally have when i'm addressing equity inside of my classroom we're gonna talk about record keeping strategies, and then we're gonna talk about the common considerations for within inside your classroom. And this is definitely one of those things where your mileage will vary. So I may bring up a concern from my classroom and you're like, but Linda, my classroom is huge. And I'm like, my classroom was super tiny. Or you're like, well, my students are fairly well off financially. My students were poor. So. Just keep in mind, these are issues I've come across in my teaching experience and how I've dealt with them inside my classroom. You may have unique ones. If you have a unique situation, I highly encourage you to put information about it in the chat so that we can talk about it. And I'm also gonna showcase how Pivot can be used to address a lot of these concerns because typically one of the easiest ways, quickest ways and safest ways that we can address equity is using the technology that our district purchases to our benefit. And as we're talking about each of these common considerations, we're gonna talk about accommodations and solutions for each one. As always, if you have any questions during the session, I highly encourage you to drop them into the chat or unmute and ask. Love hearing your questions, love answering your questions. I always say that the goal for these is to be about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes, but as I have been proven time and time again, we end up going off the rails and we're here for about an hour and a half, two hours. So the goal for today is still an hour to an hour and 15 minutes, but we'll see. It just depends on how many questions we go into. So don't stop with your questions. I always want to answer them. So to get us started for today. I think as a, an educator, when I started off in teaching, I had equality drilled into my head. All students need an equal learning experience. And I was like, that's fantastic. I can get behind this. And then over time, I saw that me giving everybody the same worksheet wasn't helping my students to have equal access to the learning. Sure, they all got the same thing, but some of my students couldn't read. Some of my students couldn't read in English. Some of my students couldn't write. Some of my students can read, but their eyesight was terrible and they couldn't read what was on the paper. Some of my students couldn't write it in a way that I could read it. They can write, it's just not fantastic. And so I started seeing that equality in my classroom didn't mean that all of my students had access to my chemistry course or my sixth grade science or my 
earth science or whatever course it was that I was teaching. And that kind of hurt me a little bit because that meant that these students would come to me and say, I don't like science. They never said, I don't like the class. They never said, I don't like that I can't do this. They would always just say, I don't like science. And I was like, but science is the best thing ever. Like science explains everything in the world. What do you mean you don't like science? Like literally everything we do is science. And they're like, I don't like science because science is not for me. And then I realized they were right. The science class I had been teaching for years was not designed for the majority of my students. Like the science that I was presenting, this equality version of science was not made for the grand majority of my students. And I was like, that's not fair because my students deserve to learn chemistry. My students deserve to learn science and to love science. They may not all go on to be chemists and that's perfectly fine. I just want them to know how chemistry impacts their lives. And then I realized, so as I started bringing in more equity approaches, I realized that equity meant that I didn't have to only provide that support for students who already had a 504 or an IEP. Particularly as high school teachers, we're not used to the development process of an IEP or 504. My best friend happens to be an exceptional student educator who has a background in autism studies. And she worked extensively with developing IEPs and 504s. The majority of educational supports, things like reading support, handwriting supports, those are developed in grades K through two. And what we as high school and middle school educators need to know is that for these support services, they're developed at a young age and they require yearly upkeep. If they are not upkept on a yearly basis, it ceases to exist. So with an IEP, if a parent goes in in their kindergarten years and they're like, hey, my kid's handwriting is atrocious, it's not getting any better. They start a testing protocol in first grade, they take a bunch of data starting in second grade. They go, yep, your student has some kind of handwriting disability. So we're going to put in all these disability supports and in elementary school. The teachers are like drilled into their skull. These are the disability supports. This is how we're going to work with it. This is how we're going to document it. This is how the parents are going to be involved and parent involvement. In elementary school is really high. Next, we transition into middle school and we see a drop off sixth grade, the grade that I taught very high parental involvement, but it's still less than elementary school because parents are starting to see our, their children as teenagers capable of their own decisions. So we're going to start seeing a drop off in parental support, which means those IEPs that require yearly maintenance start to drop off in middle school. And by the time they get to high school, the majority of students who had an IEP won't have an IEP because their parents didn't follow up on it. So we see IEPs decrease coming from elementary school. On the flip side a 504, which is a medical plan increases because medical diagnoses tend to increase as a student ages, particularly things that are puberty based. We're going to see those start sometime in late elementary, early middle school, and then move up through high school. And you can get a 504 plan for a whole variety of things. You can have a 504 plan for asthma. You can have a 504 plan for glasses. You can have a 504 plan for a pregnancy, which we all hope is something that really only high school teachers may have to encounter. But even as a sixth grade teacher, I encountered 504s for pregnancy. It's the unfortunate reality of working in the public school system is that sometimes we work with students that have emergent medical conditions and they're going to get those plans. They're very rapidly put into place and they require self advocacy from the child. Once the child is past the age of 13. So typically as a high school teacher, I only knew if a student had a 504 when the student told me, or hopefully it was inside of our SIS. For us, it was infinite campus and I saw a flag, but those often require a lot of the same supports, 
but they don't get a case manager like an IEP would. But that doesn't mean that every student that doesn't have an IEP or 504 doesn't need one. My goal as an educator is not to make my classroom equitable only for the students whose parents will come up to the school and raise hell until their child has what they need. It's not just for the students who get tested. It's not just for the students who have a mountain of proof. It's for everybody. My goal is to make my classroom accessible to every student that sits in there. So that's kind of that difference. Equality is saying everybody gets the worksheet. Equity is saying everybody gets the worksheet, but Linda is blind as a bat. So we printed it on a bigger font so that she could see it. She still gets the worksheet. It's just made in a way that she can access it. And sometimes that may be Linda gets the worksheet, but instead of having 10 questions, she has five. Or Linda gets the worksheet, but she gets a little bit extra time to work on it because she needs the extra time. Or it may be Linda is a gifted, talented student. She's going to rush through this because she already knows it. Instead of Linda getting this worksheet, we're going to let Linda move ahead. Equity looks different for each one of our kids, but we can generalize things into baskets to make our lives easier. And that's kind of what the goal is for today is to talk about the things that we're going to see a whole bunch and come up with plans to help address the majority of issues. Every one of your students will vary slightly. So you may have to modify some of these strategies just a little bit to meet a very particular student, but nine times out of 10, our strategies are going to work for that nine times out of 10. I do see a comment. Not every state treats 504s that way. You are correct. Even though 504s and IEPs are nationally established as part of the Disability Act, they're definitely one of those things that different states may have different laws that, uh, that govern them. And it may also be that your district has different implementation strategies. They are always the minimum. Go for it, Jennifer. Um, just for what it's worth, uh, 504 is covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act, so it's actually separate legislation than IEPs or if you're in a private school, it's an ISP, uh, which is covered under the Individual Education Act. There we go. Um, so IEPs only run up to the 12th grade and then they don't follow to college. A 504 can actually follow on to college. If you're in a weird state like I am in New Jersey, private schools actually can't do 504s, but that does not mean you cannot accommodate the student. I didn't know New Jersey didn't do 504s in private. They, in private. You have them in public, but not in private. I That's insane. cannot find any good reason for it, but it, it does mean that how you handle things. So, and even if you have a kid with no plan, we have discovered that um, the college board and uh, the ACT will accommodate as long as you can document what you've been doing and what the diagnosis is. Yep. And that's the great thing is that a lot of these really do impact ACT, SAT, IB exams, AP exams. Like when they sit for these state assessments, this stuff comes with them. And 504 plans, like Jennifer said, do tend to follow students into college so long as they maintain them. They even come into the workplace. We've seen an uptick in millennials and Gen Z's who are entering into the workplace who are recognizing that those services established by federal doctrine do come with them into the workplace and they're enforcing them. So this is something that I think we will see more of as generations who are used to self-advocacy are moving into those positions of self-advocacy and keep talking about their needs. And it's, it's definitely going to be a shift over the years. So my goal is always to support the student to meet the challenge. So when we go back to my worksheet example, if I'm doing a worksheet in my class for stoichiometry, like we have to drill stoichiometry. There is no other way that I can get them to do mole to mole conversions without having them write out mole to mole conversions. It's just one of those things of muscle memory. They really need to practice it. So we do worksheets. It's the best way I've found to just practice is to do it a bunch. I'm gonna make that worksheet accessible to my kids. So that may be that some of my students work on a whiteboard and some of them work on a sheet of paper. 
some of them write in pen because when their hand drags over it, it doesn't smudge as much. Some of them write in pencil. Some students may color code their worksheets. Other students may not. Some students may need it in larger font. Some of them may not. My immediate goal is to make it so that everybody in my classroom can do the thing just like everybody else with some little tweaks so that they can access it. Only if I cannot raise the student to, to meet that challenge am I going to adjust the challenge to meet the student. So if for whatever reason, I can't get my students to have realistic access to the activity. Say for instance, I'm doing a copper lab and copper ions can be really detrimental to somebody who's pregnant. So if I'm working with something where copper ions may be released, I don't typically allow students who are pregnant, particularly in their first two trimesters, to interact with that activity because there is a chance of impact to the fetus. So I don't want them to have that happen. So for those students, I can't adjust that lab. I can't say like, hey, you know what, we're just not going to use copper. The reaction's not going to work if I don't use copper. So instead, I'm going to adjust the experience for that student. And that may be I give them a different reaction. That may be that I do something like pivot interactives, which is safe. I know that there's not going to be a damage to them physically from it. It may be that I move them outside of the classroom while they're working on this activity. I'm going to do something that adjusts that original activity to meet my students. I'm only going to do that if I can't make some kind of change to the activity so that it's accessible to the student. So my goal is always to raise the child up to meet the challenge. And if that's not possible, then that challenge is gonna to have to come to meet the child. I think what's important to me here is my first reaction is never, you can't do that. I hate telling a kid you can't because they're going to shut off when you tell them you can't do this. You can't have that common experience. My goal is very rarely to tell them you can't. If I am telling them like, hey, you can't do this, it's because it is a physical danger to them. And I'm going to explain that to them so that they understand I'm doing this for your safety. Otherwise, my goal is always to say, you can be like everybody else. We're just gonna make these little tweaks because then they have the shared common experience that they can have with their classmates and peers and that helps them to feel as part of the group. So one thing that I always talk about when we're talking about equity, equality, and all of our lovely forms that come with it is that um, just like your IEP comes on paper, all of your documentation makes a bunch of paper too. If you are against the killing of the trees, this is not a great process for you. I'm so sorry. You want to keep track of your accommodations. So to make sure that not only are you going to remember it, but that you have some way to show that you have been doing it, document, 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 document. This is part of that amazing CYA that was taught to me when I was starting in, in education. It's cover your insert blank here. You want a form. You can do this digitally. I've seen a lot of Google Forms, but some things that I do, I make a log of the student's accommodation. So I have a generic log that has my typical accommodations, things like extended time, work with a partner, increased font size, change the color of the paper. Really great tip for students that have like light sensitivities. White paper is really bright under the fluorescence of our light bulbs in the classroom and that can cause a lot of eye strain. I have found that for students that have like eye sensitivities, Printing on beige paper saves so much. And for me personally, it helps a ton. And in fact, your textbooks tend to be printed on like darker paper backgrounds if they're meant for students in middle school and elementary school because it just helps with reading. It may be changing the font style. Maybe that student needs something like Com Comic Sans to help them to read. It's perfectly fine, especially since most of my resources are digital nowadays. It's fairly easy to just change a font style. But I make a log and I have the students sign it. 
And I link that log here. And it's just, this is one that I found that said, here are your quizzes, your things that you get accommodations on. I write the date in there and then any of the accommodations they, they receive, they get a check mark. If there's anything else you specify, the student signs off on it. I had a file cabinet inside of my classroom. Every single student in my class had a file in it. This form went inside of that file. So if a parent came to me and was like, you didn't give accommodations to my child, I could pull out this form and be like, here are the accommodations your child received. And because it has the student signature and the date, I have a fantastic log. These are also really helpful if you're establishing a 504 or an IEP for a student, because oftentimes they need examples of that being used and how it helps the student to establish that process. Another thing that I did was just have a master sheet of accommodations. One thing I will say, if you make a master sheet of accommodations, this needs to be incredibly secure. I kept mine, I had a red binder for emergencies that lived inside of a drawer in my classroom. And if we had a file, had a fire drill or something, the red binder came outside with me. And that had medical information, it had their accommodations, it had my attendance sheets all in one place so that if I had an emergency, I had a quick access to get to that information. But it's also a great place to just keep your master list of all the accommodations your students get. As you teach inside of your school, you'll see themes of accommodations. People who write IEPs and 504s tend to have their go-to accommodations. Things like extended time, one and a half time, two time, work in small groups, work in a separate location, reader, writer, standard accommodations, things that you'll see a lot. Mine was reduce and modify. The writers of the IEPs in my last district absolutely adored the words reduce and modify. Every IEP came with it. You'll figure that out pretty quickly. If you look at like five IEPs inside your school, you'll see the theme. Write those on your form and then just have a checkbox. Also, I like to attach a mini accommodation form to the assignment and allow the students to reject or accept their accommodations. This came really in help when I was working with seniors who are like, I haven't used that extended time in years. I don't need it. I don't want it. I'll just turn it in when I turn it in. That's fine. Mark on there that you're rejecting it, sign it, and then I keep it. Anything that I have that marks my accommodations went into the student folder. So I always kept all of them inside their student folder in my file cabinet so that at the end of the year, if I ever had a complaint that I didn't follow accommodations, I could pull out that folder and say, but I did. It was simply there and I hope that I never needed it, but it's always better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. And again, whatever you do, make sure it's secure and second nature. The double lock policy is a great thing from the public area of your building. They should have to pass through two locks to get to it. Typically that's your classroom lock and a lock on whatever it's in. If that's a file cabinet, a locking file cabinet. If that's a drawer in your classroom, a locking drawer. If that's a folder on your computer, your computer needs to be password locked so that people can't get into it. If you leave your computer signed in at all times and anybody walking into your room can just access the folder, it's not double locked. So you can even put a password on that folder to keep people out of it. Whatever you do, two lock policy is the best policy. More locks are always better, but don't make it so cumbersome that you never access it. Questions? Awesome. Okay, so real quick, why on earth do kids have 504s and IEPs and why do I need to keep track of it? Accommodation records are needed when reevaluating IEPs and 504s on a yearly basis. In Kentucky, our yearly basis was on a calendar year, so we had to update these in January every year. So oftentimes they came to me because they were like, hey, Linda, I know you have all your paperwork. And I could just hand it to them and they could say like, look, we have a teacher who said they've implemented these accommodations and they're helpful. 
Undocumented accommodations can't be used on state and national assessments. So if you have a student who's taking the AP exam, for instance, they can get extended time. But in order to get extended time, they need documentation that says that they receive extended time inside of classes. So you need a document that they get extended time. It's helpful for when you're going to college board and you're like, hey, the student gets extended time. They're going to say, prove it. This is your prove it. 504s and IEPs can follow students. As we've talked about, 504s follow them into college and into their careers, and this is very important. We're seeing this more and more nowadays. Also, repeated changes to the curriculum based on students' needs should be addressed by a curriculum committee. What I mean is, say for instance, I taught, let's talk about stoichiometry again. We taught stoichiometry and we would do two-step molar conversions and limiting reagents inside of our collaborative chemistry course. Collaborative chemistry requires a concurrent enrollment in pre-algebra, which means my students can do like 3x equals 12. That's what they're learning to solve. And we were like, we can totally do limiting reagents. No, no, we can't. That means that I need to sit down with the curriculum committee and say, hey, this curriculum is outside of the accessibility of these students. And we've seen this multiple times. We need to adjust the curriculum. It always came back to our standards and what standards were we addressing. But even though stoichiometry has limiting reagents in it, if you read the evidence statements for NGSS for limiting reagents, it's a qualitative, not quantitative. So my base level for integrated chemistry physics was a qualitative understanding of limiting reagents instead of a quantitative understanding of limiting reagents. And also last thing, as somebody who mentored teachers for a very long time, this is usually a bullet point inside of your teacher evaluations. And this is a bullet point that a lot of my new teachers missed out fairly frequently because this is that like paperwork side of teaching that we never think about. In Danielson, this is domain four. It's also domain one, but this is a really easy thing to get those full points that like exceeds expectations, distinguished teacher. This can really over, this can really increase your overall teacher performance rating by doing just like basic paperwork. So if you're one of those people that's like, I'm looking to go from developing to exceptional or from accomplished to exceptional, like you wanna move up, oftentimes the paperwork things like this really do help your teaching overall rating. So I highly recommend look at your state's evaluation. We use Danielson in Kentucky where I was. I've used other methods in other states. Find where those points are. And a lot of times how well you work with IEPs and 504s is weighted pretty heavily. And just an important note, what we're gonna be talking about today are accommodations. We're gonna be talking about things that are mandated as part of that IEP or 504. We're not gonna talk about general scaffolds that you do for your whole class. These are accommodations that are meant for individual students to meet individual needs. So these are things that we're just gonna have on hand that we pull out as we need them for those one or two kids. Whereas scaffolds are changes to your class expectation and those are things that you set and you tend to take away over time we're not taking away accommodations over time. They're gonna get these accommodations from day one to day 180 in your classroom. So just keep in mind, while we may use similar techniques to scaffold, accommodations are permanent, scaffolds tend to be something that you will remove over time. If you're interested in learning about scaffolding, next Monday is our scaffolding session. But let's take a look at some of these. So I'm going to start off with physical considerations inside of our classroom, because I think this is one that we talk about the least and has the most physical impact on our children. Things like allergies. I'm a chemistry and physics teacher. There are a ton, ton of activities that involve balloons. You can do a lot in a classroom with a balloon. Problem. Latex allergies are one of the most common allergies in the United States. It's right up there with peanuts. 
a lot of students can have very severe allergies to latex and the more you come into contact with latex the worse your allergies get so we want to reduce the uh, the chances of a student coming in contact with latex well problem if we're doing balloon labs all day long they're going to come in contact with latex a lot but then you get somebody like me i have a very severe latex allergy can't even go into a room that has a balloon my kids can't stand it they're like mom we never get balloons you're right don't because mom likes to have a pulse <laughs> epi pens are rough but there was a lab i used to always do how many of you as chemistry teachers have done the magnesium and hydrochloric acid lab for stoichiometry or for gas laws it's a really simple lab it's a lot of fun. When you do it in your room, you can take a balloon, add magnesium powder to it, and then you, in an early Meyer flask, have concentrated hydrochloric. You tip the balloon over, the magnesium powder falls into the uh, hydrochloric acid. We have a single replacement reaction, it produces hydrogen gas, the balloon fills with gas. And what you can do is you can hold the volume of acid the same and change the mass of magnesium powder added and you'll see that over like there is a plateau there's a point in which the balloon does not continue to expand awesome lab downside severe latex allergy i used to do it in my classroom before my allergy was as bad as it is now by literally standing on the opposite end of my room explaining to the students how to do the lab and then watching from afar and being like, little Johnny, I need you to put your goggles back on or please don't throw the balloon at Susie. That's bad. Kind of rough for classroom management, but it also meant that I was still coming in contact with these balloons and eventually got to a point where I couldn't. And so I was like, dang it, I'm going to have to get rid of this lab, but I really like this lab. And then I found pivot. And so I'm going to do this one right here is randomized and auto graded. And we'll do this in split question view. Here's the activity. They are asked to write the balanced equation. They see the magnesium metal put on the balance. That's hydrochloric acid inside of the tube. This one always gets people. That is tube magnets stuck inside of the tube. Magnesium is not magnetic but it's bent in a U shape so that it'll sit on the magnets so that when we turn the magnets, it flips over. So that's all that is. It's a holding area for the magnesium. We're gonna stick a tube in it. And down here, we have an open-ended glass rod with a stopper in it. As the gas evolves, it's gonna go through the tube and push the stopper. And we're going to get a measure of how much gas was created, but it just stopped. The students are going to be asked in this activity to figure out how much gas is going to evolve. So here it says start with trial six. There are six trials here, so I'm going to load it. What is the scale reading for trial six? 0.177. I got it right, cool. How many moles of magnesium is this? Pull out a calculator, calculate my answer in moles. Figure out how many moles of hydrogen gas would be produced, and then it says show your work. And then figure out how many milliliters of hydrogen gas would be produced. What's cool here is that this is taking my qualitative lab from class, where I was just doing balloons and we're looking at a about how big the balloon gets. Now this is making it a quantitative lab because I can actually measure the milliliters of gas produced, but it said the reaction's incomplete. The student's going to make a prediction and then they're going to check it. So if I lock answers and continue, I go to trial six. Now they can actually see how much gas evolved. I'm taking the same activity that I did and I'm actually expanding on it. And I'm removing the entire concern in my classroom of balloons. I'm not having to teach my students how to thread literally anything into a rubber stopper. 
which is the best part of my life because having taught students how to thread a glass rod into a rubber stopper with lubricant, I'm glad I never have to say that you just need to put a little bit on the tip and put it into the rubber stopper, squeeze a little bit and twist just a little bit to a room full of 16 year olds. It's an innuendo that I didn't enjoy having to do every year. But here, they're gonna see the reaction come to completion. I still get the same experience of my classroom. Like this isn't something that they would necessarily need to touch in their room. The only thing that they would have done is stuck the magnesium metal into the hydrochloric acid while I said, please don't inhale the hydrochloric acid fumes. Please don't touch the hydrochloric acid. Please wear gloves if you have sensitive skin and then stick a stopper in it. Like they didn't move the magnet. Oh no. But I got the exact same thing, but this is auto graded and randomized. This is an opportunity where I can go above and beyond what I was doing inside my classroom while also having it randomized, while also having it auto grade, and while also going into more detail than what I would have done inside my room. And I'm avoiding all the physical considerations of doing this inside my classroom. This is safer. This is way faster to set up. There's no allergens here. And my students are getting feedback the entire time. This became a very straightforward replacement for a lab that I physically couldn't do anymore. And I didn't bat an eye at it because this saved me time. And as I've talked about in the past, I had way too many preps. So something like this just improved my classroom. Even though I'm doing something that may be to help one person, it's going to overall help everybody because this is a quick change that I can do. If you still want to do that lab inside your classroom, that's fine. You could use this activity in place of that lab for the one or two students that need a true change to the activity because they can't interact with latex. Any questions? Awesome. So let's look at another accommodation that we need to consider. I think we're seeing this one more, particularly inside of sciences. We have the consideration of visual impairments. And visual impairments could be that the student is heart has a hard time seeing things. So maybe they have reduced vision or they lack vision, or it could be that they have color vision issues, which can tend to crop up inside of units where color is a problem. So for example, teaching chemistry, color only really mattered when I got to acid bases and we started talking about universal indicator solution because universal indicator solution has a rainbow effect and the color adjusts based on the pH going from red to purple. Well, problem, if you have a color impairment, it can be really difficult to see the difference between red and green or red and blue or yellow and green. And those issues make it so that an entire unit is kind of off limits for that kid. It's also kind of difficult to just constantly enlarge the print. So maybe I've got students that they're hard of sight. They just need bigger print. Cool. We make it bigger. But what if my student has like a full visual impairment? We have some options inside of pivot. Option number one is we actually offer an alt text library. And this is something that's shared with teachers on a case by case basis. So if this is something that you know you need, please reach out to our support and we can add you to this library. This alt text library is activities. So take, for example, the solubilities rules. And what they get is an alt text of the video. Now, I want to point out something about this alt text because something you don't think about when we do things like measurements inside of a video is that by providing an alt text, we can't expect the student to use a ruler to make a measurement. 
They're not going to be able to use a stopwatch to figure out the time. And they're not going to be able to see a color change. If they need an alt text, then this student has significant visual impairments, meaning that they're not able to see the video on their own. So we need to explain the video so that they can understand what's going on without having to see it, which often means that measurements and observations are included in the alt text. That means this alt text includes answers. Things that you would expect other students to figure out on their own, they have to be included in the alt text. So these should not be used with your general courses. Alt texts are meant for those students who specifically need them because they obviously include some answers. So here, for example, it says the results of the video from the alkaline and nitrates are as follows. In each video, the salt is added to a test tube with water. The solutions are mixed with a glass rod. For the cobalt nitrate solution, the salt is reddish orange color that fully dissolves in the water, turning bright, turning the solution red. That means that if I go to the cobalt nitrate one, that's what we see is an orangish salt that when mixed turns it an orangish red. We can't expect somebody with a visual impairment to see that, so we have to explain it to them. But if you expected another student in your class who didn't have a visual impairment to see it, don't give them the alt text version. And again, these are all available. You can gain access to these. We also have started adding alt text to the images of our activities so that these activities will naturally read with a screen reader. But Pivot does work with the screen reader tools that are built into your, uh, into your browser. So check out the screen readers that you have. Chrome has a screen reader. Some schools will adopt special screen readers, but Pivot does work with a screen reader. Another thing that you can do, let me come back over to this library. I'm just gonna open this one because it has some tools here. Sometimes even for me, these things can be hard to see. So for example, I'm seeing the top view up here and it's showing me when it's cut and it's my expectation to make a measurement. That ruler can be difficult for even me to see. So if I back this up, we go to there. Okay, it's cut. So that's my start point. I may look at that and say, Linda, I can't read that. That's not, mm -mm. Each one of our videos has the ability to go to full screen and that can be a lot easier to read. So if you have somebody who just needs to zoom in on a video, full screen is fantastic. Note, Chromebooks are awful for being able to do things in full screen because Chromebooks are a tiny screen to start with. So this is going to mean that you are constrained to your uh, screen size. Personally, as somebody who uh, has Coke bottle glasses for a reason, that's a 43 inch monitor. I can actually read this. Personally, I just bought a TV and plugged an HDMI cable into it. But this is gonna vary based on you, your classroom, your needs. A lot of times for my students that just need to zoom in, we found them a bigger monitor so that when they did full screen, it actually was big enough for them to see it. And one other thing I always like to talk about is chronic health conditions that lead to high absences. I have a son with special needs. He has cystic fibrosis. That means as he gets older, he's going to miss school. He already misses school a butt ton as it is because we have doctor's appointments all the time. It only gets worse as he gets older. He's going to miss a lot of school. He's going to have chronic absences. Those students, the answer should not be, well, you missed the lab, I guess you can't do it. Why not just make it a pivot or make it an online lab? That way, if they miss the lab, Realistically, I can't set up that lab again. So instead of saying, well, I guess you don't do it at all, just say, here's an alternative. Here's an online opportunity that you can do. Or you can make these collabs. You can assign these activities in groups to your students and assign somebody who's chronically absent 
to a group where the students are there so that they can get the data. And then they can answer their questions one on one in a separate activity. Other things that I like to think about are the size of my classroom. Some activities are fairly large. Looking at you, Atwood machine. When I do modified Atwood machines for physics, uh, those things are big and they take up a lot of space. And my classroom was tiny, did not have a lot of space. So oftentimes anything that was really large or cumbersome to move in between classes, we did online because I just didn't have access to it. Or things like fire. Well, I lost a fire exit at one point in my school teaching, so we only had one fire exit. I couldn't safely do labs that required a fire exit. So anything that required a fire, we did online so that my students could still have that opportunity and I'm not putting anybody at risk. So the next one I want to talk about is social emotional accommodations. I feel like these definitely came up to the forefront during the COVID years because when my students went virtual, I taught in a really low income area, but also in an incredibly rural area, which meant most of my students didn't have access to social media because they didn't have access to the internet. These students were physically isolated for our entire time that we were online. I had students that from the moment we left on March 13th, until when school resumed in September, that was a six month period where they had incredibly limited access to the outside world, typically less than two times per month that they left their house. We all love our families, but that doesn't mean that we wanna be locked in a house with them for six months with no contact with anybody else. It's gonna make the best of us stir crazy. We found in research especially you can read all these studies down here, a significant portion of our students had negative social impacts from the pandemic. We saw regression in social, uh, in social achievements for students. Younger students would show aggression. They would show inappropriate behaviors. We saw an uptick in addiction in young people, particularly nicotine and alcohol. You may see that your students are less likely to communicate in the ways that they've learned because they've been at home with no communication with anybody other than their family. And so ways that they talk in their home are going to be exemplified and just made so much worse. So if they have bad habits at home, they brought them back with the pandemic. The longer the student was out of school, the worse these got. So if you're in a place, Kentucky, where I was, we went back the start of last school year, the start of last school year. So my students were fully in person for the last two years. But if you're in a school where last year was your first year back, you probably saw this upfront and personal. These students don't understand due dates. They don't understand classroom rules. The idea of no roughhousing just blows their mind. Why can't I have food whenever I want? Why do I have to wear normal clothes? I wore pajamas for the entire time of the pandemic. Nobody got mad at me then. All of these things are being combated inside of classrooms right now. We will definitely see less of these concerns over time, but longstanding traumas leave a mark. We will see these in our students for a while. It's gonna get a little better, but I don't expect them to go away until this generation of students exits the school system. So we're looking at this for as high school teachers, probably 10 to 12 years. So we need to recognize that we want to get to know our students so that we can reintroduce them to the society of the school. That may be that for our super shy kids who have only gotten more shy during the pandemic, we kind of start poking at their shell earlier and more vigorously. Hey, I want to get to know you. What do you like to read? What do you like to listen to? What kind of candy do you like? Like, what's your opinion on these things? Get to know you questions are something that you can pretty easily embed into a lot of things. I embedded get to know you questions into a lot of my activities early in the school year in a variety of places. A common one that I would do was every time I had a sub day, my Google form that had all their instructions would have a thing that was like, 
I have read and understood the activity assignment for today. I don't have any questions. I do have questions. Insert your questions below. And then it would be some get to know you question. I, you know, recently the Florida Gators played against Alabama and they got crushed. What'd you think of the game results? What was the football team that you watched this weekend? Or do you even watch football at all? Or I found this music video. Do you guys like this kind of music? Or whatever. Meme threads, questions about them, when's your birthday, line them up based on their height and then make them think pair share with the person that's, you know, the opposite of them in the classroom. Those things that I use to get to know them, I can even embed those questions inside of Pivot. There's nothing stopping you from adding any question you want to the platform. So for example, a common start of the year activity I see in biology, come over here, is water properties. And so I'm gonna look at this one right here. Oh, this is a boiling point of water. Simple thing to start us off, there's actually five different points here. This is designed for an AP bio course. But this is just looking at the properties of water and it's going to ask them to watch the video, identify the points when each one boils. I'm going to put this into split question view. And then I could say, you know what? I like this section. I like where this is going. I'm going to add a question down here. This one says the highest recorded registered air temperature on earth was recorded on July 10th, 1913 in Death Valley. Considering this, why is it so important uh, that water should have the highest boiling point? Maybe below that I asked them, just out of curiosity, what was the temperature on the day and place that you were born? Go look it up. And now I know which one of my kids are from the district, which one of my kids are from far away. The kids who've moved from far away, why'd you guys move out here? You're from California, why are you in Kentucky? What brought you to here? Why this school, this place? Or it's so cool, you've lived here your whole life. What's kept y'all here in this county? Oh, you have family or you have a farm here. That's really cool. It's a little starter question that gives you a little bit more about your kids. It doesn't need to be graded. It's just a, a quick question to ask them to get to know them. And to do that, I just add this to my library Let's take it in my personal library. I can come over to that personal library. There's the activity. I click edit. The activity content takes a second to load because this is a big activity. So this is real loading times. There we go. You didn't break it if it takes a little bit to load. It's just a big activity. And particularly if you have slower internet, it could take even longer. But I just come over to that activity. I'm going to add an open-ended question worth no points out of curiosity. What was the temperature when you were born? List the location and temp in your answer. Does Pivot still report ad, uh, support adding graders? It does. And that is a great way that you can do accommodations. So let me head over to one of my teacher accounts. This is going to take forever to save and show you how to add accommodations. Get inside of here. So when you're inside of a class, I'm just gonna go to the first one, click view class and roster, and it says add graders. And you can type in the email address of any of the caseworkers that are on an account and they will have greater access. So if I do lynda.detweiler plus grader at pivotinteractives.com, that person's added, 
what's nice is when that teacher is added to the course, when they log in, all of the classes that they are greater on show up inside of their My Classes list. Graders can grade assignments, they can view student work, they can leave feedback, they cannot assign student work. They can also edit activities if you give them editor access to the activity. So what that means is if you have an activity that you want your uh, grader to work on, go to your activity library. I usually make one that's called accommodations. I spell accommodations today. And we'll say this is chem accoms for 22-23, create. Inside of my personal library, I want that balancing act one to be in there. So I'm going to copy it to that accommodations library. And what that means is that's the accommodations version of whatever activity I'm working on. This is the version that I will assign to specific students for accommodations. I just need to make sure that whoever has access to this, I can come over here and say that that same grader, interactives.com has editor access, and now they can edit everything that's in there, which means I can allow their case manager to make edits to the activity. Yes, that is a fantastic question. Are you going to show more advanced mechanics of adding and changing questions within Pivot in subsequent webinars? I am. That is a whole week, and that is all of next week. So all of next week is specifically about the editor. We're going to go into a ton of detail where I show you all the ins and outs. There's one other session that's really going to dive into the editor. And that's the last week of July. There's a day on just randomization and auto grading where we're going to look at all of the new randomization features that came out and how to make essentially any activity you want completely auto grade. Because now we can randomize words, pictures, and numbers and question uh, and the question answers within something and it all still auto grades. It's fantastic. So all of next week will be a session on the editor. Those sessions will definitely be longer. Just a heads up. We will butt up to that two and a half hour mark every single day. Um, but we will go into incredible detail and we'll build an activity in every session. So if you want that grader to have editing access, just make sure that you give them access to the library and the class. And then they can modify their activities. They can do anything they want. The only thing they can't do is assign work you'll still be the one to assign work because it's your class. One other thing I like to think about when we're doing things inside my classroom is socioeconomic impact. So take for instance, we're doing a project at home where the students are gonna look at the water quality of their house. Okay, I grew up poor. We had well water. I had well water from a well that was drilled when the house was built. My house was officially built in 1901 which meant that the well had to be re-drilled a couple of times, but it still wasn't the best well on the face of the earth. Like I can very vividly remember what the pump house looked like outside and watching as they re-drilled that yearly. I would never have wanted to do a water quality test of my water from home because I knew what it was drinking and I knew it wasn't the best thing on the face of the earth. I did not need my classmates to also be aware that the water that I was drinking at home was not the best. So it may be that your students have access to the supplies and they're embarrassed. They don't want you to know how bad it is at home. On the flip side, your students may not have access to something at all. Things like making a poster as simple as that seems for a $1 poster. I remember never being able to get that poster board. That was something that was not accessible to me, even though it was so cheap. So I relied on either getting my poster board from the teacher or the school, or I just didn't do the project. And as a teacher, I made sure to supply those supplies. But there are some things where I can't feasibly supply that for everybody. So we use online resources. One thing to note about resources like Pivot is that they do require internet access. 
So if this student is working on this activity at home, they need internet access to do this. So if you plan on the students doing something, you're like, oh, this activity is going to take 35 minutes to finish. That's 20 minutes of my class time and 15 minutes at home. Okay, not every kid has 15 minutes at home and not every kid has internet at home. Pivot requires them to have internet. What they can do is if they're working at home, they can have this up and things like the text boxes, they can still type in them. Data tables, they can still type in them. Multiple choice questions, they can still answer. They just can't submit anything until they're connected to the internet. So they could work on all this and when they connect to the internet, submit everything. But that means that if the page were to refresh, they would lose it because our auto saving features auto save while connected to the internet. If they're not connected to the internet, they're going to get a giant red bar that says you're not connected. Check your connection. We don't recommend using pivot interactives offline. This is not designed to be used offline. It's not designed to be printed and handed to somebody. Like as much as I would love to say, make a flip book of this video, every single one of those frames would need to be its own little picture. That's going to be a pretty thick flip book. So these aren't designed to be done offline. We don't recommend using pivot offline. That is an equity concern when you're doing activities like this with your students. I'm not going to assign online work in a district where I know the majority of my students have low to no internet access and saying, oh, just use the hotspot on your phone. Using a student's data can be a really touchy subject because that data may be their only connection to the outside world when they're at home. So I try not to eat up their data, even though pivot is a very low data intensity. Each one of these active, each one of these videos loads when you pull up the program. So if they load it at school, all the videos will load then and they are saved to the cache on your computer, which means that if you reaccess this, it will still pull from what's already been loaded. So it's only going to load once, but that's still data to eat up. And while you're like, that might be their TikTok or their Snapchat, that might also be their support, their support system that they're having to trade to do your homework. Some other common accommodations that I come across model and reinforce organizational systems. This is for students who have struggles with keeping track of due dates, or maybe they have ADHD or ADD. So they need help learning to build systems so that they can keep track of things post-it notes or a planner. One of the cool things about Pivot is that you can scaffold these to teach them to look for keywords, or you can set up specific due dates for each one of the parts. Maybe you're like, this activity is going to take three days. I'm going to chunk it for you. You're going to do part one on this day, part two on this day, part three on this day, and set individual due dates so that they have three due dates for that same activity that everybody else, it's still due the same time. They're still doing the same work. You've just chunked it for them. You can also do things like bolding text, underlining text, highlighting things, just to cause little pieces of information to jump out. Modify the amount of blank. This was my school's favorite was reduce and modify. With things like Colab, you can make the reduced and modified versions of activities and assign them to individual students. So what that means is, say this is my modified version of the activity. I only want this to go to four kids inside my class. I can go to my class, and this is a new feature, by the way. I'm going to come over here to the second chem series. And I'm going to add an assignment. And we'll come up to that accommodations folder. There it is. Click assign. You can set a due date. So if this student is supposed to have a due date that's three days longer, make it three days longer. You can set a visible date. I don't tend to hide things inside my classroom. It's more work than it's worth. But down here, you have the option to assign to individuals or collab groups. We looked at collab groups yesterday, but just in case you missed it, in collab groups, what that does is I can set a number of groups. I want everybody to be placed randomly. I click create 
and all of my students go into, into groups randomly. But if I want to assign an activity to only particular students, I can look at my class list and say, okay, this activity is only going to go to Linda. And now I have a list of only her. I can select out the couple of kids that I want, click assign. And now for that student, if I come to that activity, you'll see Linda's the only person that has access to that activity. So if you make a modified version, you can just assign it to only that student and they'll be the only one that knows that it's there. A lot of times I even title them the same so that my students think they're the same activity. But when I go in and grade it, I see that it's two different activities. So now they have that peace of mind that if they're, if one of their classmates looks onto their activity, it looks the same from the outside looking in. I'm the one that knows that they're different and I know that I can grade them differently. Another one that I see often is things like use written directions to supplement oral directions. Obviously you can very easily embed videos into Pivot. This could be if you've read the instructions to the students and you want to make sure that you have a video of it, you can film yourself re reading your instructions and just add that as an instructor instance upload. You can upload your own videos. Screen recordings, by the way, this right here, these are actually low file sizes. You would think they'd be massive, but a screen recording to get that 50 megabyte limit, you can typically get about five minutes of a screen recording. Keep in mind when you're reading instructions, your students have very low stakes into that. They don't want to listen to you. Two to three minutes is really all they're gonna get. And as always, break assignments into smaller, into a smaller series of assignments. I see this a lot with project accommodations or like year long things that students need to keep up with. Every teenager known to man should probably have this accommodation because if you ask a student to work on the same thing and tell them, oh, it's due on the last day of the class, they're not going to start on it until the night before. And every single one of your teenagers is going to be like, oh, I can do that later. Later never comes. They will panic the night before and try to do a year's worth of work in eight hours and it's not healthy. So split it up into smaller parts. You can split an activity into different parts. You can split it into sections. There's so many different ways that you can split an activity. The easiest way I found to do this is that when I'm inside of my library, Say this is the activity, this one had five parts. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna copy it five times. So one copy, two copies, three copies, and that's my fourth copy. So now I have five of my copy, 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 copies. And I just edit them. I changed the name instead of it saying copy, 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 copy. This is part five. And in the activity content, I just delete out everything that isn't part five. Wait for it to load. Come over to a section. Delete. Yep. Move to the next section. Delete. Yep. And so I can pretty quickly delete these. And because it's inside of my personal library, I have this for next year. So next year when I do this exact same activity, all of this is already done. And if I'm working on a large team, I can share this with everybody on my team. So maybe you're on a biology team of seven teachers. Split up the labs that you're doing seven ways and say each one of us is gonna make modifications for a lab this unit or for a lab this year, because realistically, I did one or two pivots a unit. So that's 15 to 20 a year. If there's five people on your team, you're each modifying maybe three or four. 
So don't feel that you need to do these all by yourself. Teamwork makes the dream work. Is there any way to delete pivots out of my personal library? There is. Head to that personal library. Take a look at the activity and archive it. And poof, it's gone. Archived is our version of deleted. We, we tend not to delete things just because then you'll come back and you're like, I deleted it by accident. Archiving it is deletion. It's just deleting that you can undo. And if you're interested in more common 504 and IEP accommodations, particularly for high schoolers, I linked all of those down below. These were excellent resources for me when I was in the classroom and I hope they help you too. And then some other accommodations, we'll go through these pretty quickly. Use a variety of methods for teaching. The nice thing is with Pivot, you can do this online. You can do it as sensors. You can do it in person and put the data into Pivot. You can blend it however you want. Pivot was never my like sit and get. It was, we're gonna watch a YouTube video with this and we're gonna do the pivot and we're gonna do this. Maybe I do a multimodal piece where like we do a hands-on demo and then we go into pivot. I would, I would vary the things that I did during my day. Provide peer tutoring. Colab is perfect for this because you can pair students together so they can work together on activities. For extended time, online assignments are fantastic because if they need extra time, you just extend their due date. And then your other students have the same due date. It's very easy to keep track of those due dates online. Introduce definitions of terms and vocabulary and review to check for understanding. Multiple choice questions are great for this. We already do this a lot inside of our introduction activities. Instead of asking students, like say, here's your list of five steps, we may give them step one and then say, why is step one relevant? Or which one of these would be the best step two? We make our instructions multiple choice questions so that they engage the student. You can do the same thing with vocabulary. Rather than just telling them the definition of a word, engage them with that vocabulary term in a question and introduce it through that question. And by making it an unlimited answer, you're essentially removing the stakes from it. You don't need to put a score on those questions. They're not giving you any kind of feedback because that question is being used to teach them rather than to evaluate their knowledge. And as always, pre-teach or reteach important concepts. This is where I would embed YouTube videos or even videos of yours truly explaining concepts before the students worked as a quick way to like remind them, hey, you're inside of chemistry class. This is the things we've been doing recently. Think of it as like the tape at the start of 51st dates, except for your lesson. And as always, reduce paper pencil or on the flip side, we've seen more reduce computer things. Pivot is not optimized for printing. You can print a pivot and I'll show you what it looks like. Let's preview this activity. To print a pivot, you right click print. It's going to save it as a PDF. Here's what that looks like. This is what it looks like when you download and print it. This is not the best viewing option. You could technically print a pivot. It's not designed for that. Like this is not optimized for writing. The questions cut off in different places. These pictures are huge. Like some places overlap because you can see this is a video instance, the video instance not printed. That's all problematic. So just keep in mind, these are not designed to be done on paper. If you're gonna scaffold an activity, you can always reduce the reading that's involved. And I like to do auto graded questions and hints to nudge my students towards a correct answer. Because it's auto grading, you can set the number of submissions and let them do it as many times as they need to. Now you can say everybody in the class gets four times, but Susie gets eight. And just make that accommodation for that student, save it, and now you have an accommodated version for the future. But with that, that is all of my content for today. And I would love to open this up to any questions that you may have.
we've answered a few and we actually got pretty close to being finished in an hour and 15 minutes look at that so if there's any questions i'd love to answer them but if not thank you so much for coming and i hope to see you tomorrow where we're going to talk about grit everybody's favorite thing with students how do i get them to stop saying i can't do this while it's too hard lies all bold-faced lies